Marvelous. So I'm Ramsey Brown, CEO of the AI Responsibility Lab, one of the co-hosts for today's Responsible AI Symposium. Grateful to Todd and AILA and the greater AILA community for joining us and sponsoring this day and attending. And I'm extremely grateful to Stephen Ibaraki for joining us today. Stephen, it's great to get to catch up. I'm excited for our conversation. And I'd love for you to just share a little bit, because of course you and I know each other, but I'd love for you to share just a little bit with our audience yourself, the path you've taken, because you're not only quite accomplished in the space, but you've gotten to hold some, some very special roles in forming the norms around how we think about AI and how it should be used for good. Wow, that's... <laughs> uh, so just to the audience, uh, thank you everybody for participating. I, I think it's an awesome event. And that's a really interesting question because I've been doing this stuff for so long. I mean, uh, I built a computer when I was 10. I, I got really interested in innovation and things like that. Went into teaching really to give back. And and then uh, for many years, in like three decades or more, I've been talking about the ethics of AI and, or I guess even 40 years now, try, trying to get that more embedded in things. And even uh, with the UN prior to the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 to 2015 and the Sustainable Development Goals. And then... Uh, I uh, did a, a lot of speaking on this. And then, of course, I approached uh, ITU, the U United Nations ITU, and I said, uh, we really need to really think and bake into the Sustainable Development Goals AI, but for good purposes and have principles and and really as a contrast for AI for bad. <laughs> right? So, right. And, and guess what? That's what happened. Uh, we, you know, we created this thing called AI for Good with the United Nations ITU. And in fact, this is our fifth anniversary in June. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're the largest uh, platform. It's a meme used by governments like Switzerland, uh, uh, corporations like Microsoft as an AI for Good program. It's used by research groups and it's everywhere, right? So, and we got people thinking in this way, how can it be used to help with poverty and hunger and how can we use for diversity and inclusion? How, how about uh, making sure that we get this broad sort of adoption? And in fact, out of, out of Southern California, I just want to do a shout out to the CEO Leadership Alliance. Amazing work. They definitely are really the, around the principles of AI for good. They, they got this AI Center of Excellence centered on talent development and diversity and so on. They're working with high schools and colleges and universities and a CEO led and they're mentoring and so on. So anyways, that's sort of a picture about AI and AI for good and, and really having it used across business and government and industry and so on. And the perspective that you have for it, I think is so refreshing, especially in the responsible AI community, because we talk so often about responsible AI or AI safety only looking at one half of the court, which is the half about mitigating the downsides, the risks, the harms, the externalities, um, looking at the parts where things are not going the way they could be if we lived in that version of society we would aspire to have. And the work for AI for Good acknowledges that this is a very real consideration, but it focuses on the other half, which is how do we take these tools and methodologies and focus them towards the good that must be done? And I like this distinction because it's 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 not just saying we need to control for the harms. It's saying there there is upside here to be had. So so you've had the perspective, you know, of course, approaching the UN's ITU program and kicking this off. But as it's matured and grown now, what do you still see as the major opportunities to support the sustainable development goals with AI that still get you optimistic based on where this appears to be going? You know, you know, clearly it's now baked in every one of the 17 sustainable development goals. And and it, you see this wide adoption across the industry. Microsoft, for example, if you watch the Microsoft Build conference a few weeks ago, it was, they had a section on responsible AI. So, I mean, that's so, uh, you know, I, I see this commitment by these corporations to to do this, to bake it into their solutions, like their a Azure platform. They, they definitely have responsible AI tools in there so that if I'm a developer, I can make sure that I develop with this in mind. I'm a judge for the Imagine Cup, which has been around for over two decades, over two million students developing applications in this global contest. 
And in fact, I just wrote a, a couple of Forbes articles on it, one called the Imagine Cup and the World Champions and what they've done. And the Imagine Cup youth as a follow-up article in Forbes. And you should look at them, yeah, the, the, the passion, the commitment, and the excitement. But a key criteria was responsible AI. And that is thinking about it in a proactive way, making sure that it's baked in. And it doesn't matter what the application is, make sure it's baked in. So not just the SDGs and the UN, but anything you're doing. And it's just heartwarming to see these young people doing these developments and and, and really things that could transform the world in a positive way. Right, because we look at this this moment in which we have, you know, for, for many people in recent history, this is a time that is defined by a confluence of a lot of major global critical factors for which we are simultaneously trying to navigate uh, both climate crises and climate change, as well as increasing geostability challenges and the rise of different types of uh, trustworthiness around liberal democracy, um, disinformation. We're looking at at legitimate serious problems that in a very like post Francis Fukuyama kind of way, we, we thought maybe it was just smooth sailing for another 50 years. And it turns out unsurprisingly so that reality was a little more complicated. And when you look at the power that these young people, these types of competitions, these tools have to do good there, what gets you the most excited? What do you look at and say, this is this is the thing that I think is going to help deliver us through like that? You know, there's a broader perspective and I'm seeing this particularly amongst the young people. So, you know, by definition, and, I, you know, you'll see some years uh, sort of vary, but, you know, millennials are what, post 1997 and onwards to about uh, 2012. The alpha generation is 2012 onwards. Uh, you know, you have Generation X, I guess, around 1981. Uh, or Generation Y, I guess, sorry, from 1981 going forward to about 1996. But uh, particularly in the uh, really, you know, Generation um, Z and Alpha Generation, you see this uh, very broad perspective. And this broad perspective is not just about humanity, it's about ecosystems as well. So we're, we're not just responsible for humankind, we're responsible for uh, plant life and animal life and really the holistic sort of understanding of a better world. And that, that includes things like um, making sure that we're very conscious of the impact on the climate. And, and I'm seeing this broad application in, in the thinking and sort of the motivation. And, and that's, I, I think, is very positive. And I see the application of AI in all of those broad areas. So not just human centric and augmenting humans and helping humans, but also helping in, for example, uh, can we help with marine life and the protection of marine life? Can we help with things like plastics in the ocean? Uh, can we help in terms of weather and, and having a better handle on weather and, and climate impact? And there are definitely applications in AI in all of those areas. So, And, and you're going to see this continue to proliferate. And I see these as inflection points to help counteract some of the negative aspects that have been talked about or the kind of the AI for bad, even if it's not intentional, it's, you know. So, so I work in that space, but we're very conscious of the other side and how to mitigate the risks in those other sides. And you're seeing the uh, top um, academic organizations or, or professional societies, for example, I, I'm on the board of ACM and, and I chair one of their professional development committees of the board and and they're very conscious about diversity and inclusion and also uh, supporting all of the principles behind AI for good. I see that with the IEEE, uh, which is the largest sort of computing engineering organization in the world. And ACM, by the way, is the number one computing science organization in the world. So you're seeing all of the these positive aspects. So there's an institute in Southern California called the Terasaki Institute of Biomedical Innovation and really, if you look at all of the things they're doing, of which it incorporates AI, but much more, it's really about how can we do you know, positive footprints. For example, they've created a, an analog where they can grow meat, but not through animals. You can just choose cellular cultures and bioreactors. And, and so you can offset all of the aspects that come with having animals, but doing it uh, uh, through these bioreactors and or this idea, the Yamanaka factors, you know, these four molecules you can use to regress um, 
you know, uh, uh, human cells into stem cells and then grow them into organoids, but the intersection of that with AI as well. So it's, it's even beyond AI, it's any kind of innovation, but AI is always infused in all of it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a thing that, that we're realizing with our, our platform mission control, that when, you, when we just talk about AI as if we're just talking about Star Wars, we're just talking about something that's very futuristic, or for a lot of people, they conflate with imagery from Hollywood about these, these, these potential fictional worlds of, of Android buddies or, or villains yet to come. We, we lose sight that when it really comes down to it, the world's most successful teams are using AI every day and have been for some years now in the very quotidian context of how they just use data every organization, every team, every field and pursuit that has gone through the early stages of the digital transformation or computerization now takes everything they do and it ends up in Microsoft Excel or it ends up in a database or it ends up in some sort of cloud formation. And that next step of, so what? What are we going to do with that? How is that going to drive us towards the next step? Well, that's where data science steps in. And that's what we look at. Would our business benefit from being able to predict something, given some information, or be able to tell things apart? And when we frame it like that, that seems like a pretty obvious thing that businesses would like to be able to do to operate faster and better. That seems like a pretty obvious thing that drives innovation. And if we couch that as the conversation around AI, we're pretty far down this pipeline. And as we recall that we're still in the opening chapters of the digital transformation, and yet we're here, we have so much in front of us. So as, I, as we kind of get into the last few moments of our, our fireside here, I've got two questions for you. The first is, what do you think is the most likely largest blind side in the future that we should be looking at in terms of AI? Like, what do you think that you see accurately that most of their leaders aren't seeing yet and you wish they knew? What's that blind side? You know, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a great question. And it's a great question because I actually did a private uh sort of briefing to the, the some of the heads of the, well, actually all of the CXOs of the, uh, who are handling the technology of the UN and so on. And, and I do a lot of private uh, consultations with CEOs and investors on that uh, particular topic area. The thing is that with, with all of the aspects of AI, um, really it's unbounded. It, you know, in 2017, it actually crossed every sector where there were examples and use cases of AI. So it's it's and it's and its use can continue to grow, like this idea of DeepMind and uh, AlphaFold. Uh, they created this uh, protein folding um, technology where you could predict how amino acids fold into proteins and and proteins and and how they misform uh, and so on. Your bodies account for many diseases we have. So this was something that was thought to be you know 20, 30 years into the future, but now we can do it in minutes or or a few hours or. You, or something that would take uh, much longer in the lab. So really there aren't any big challenges in a sense, in that sense of where it could go, but you know, um, you, you've got to be able to manage that it's not going to be misused. And that's already been talked about so much, right? So, and, and people are pretty well aware of that. Even this idea of data and having data repositories and making sure that you ingest that so you can have better lives, by better ecosystems around the planet, you now have synthetic data. So you don't even have to rely on data capture so much now because you can create it using synthetic data. So one of the big challenges is really just misuse. <laughs> and, and of course, everything that we talked about, it could be misused, right? Uh, it could be used yeah. mis all the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, it could be misused against all of those aspects of the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So. And that's the biggest challenge is to make sure it's not misused. And then the unintended consequences of, of where it could go. And, you know, there's this idea of artificial general intelligence and, and you're seeing some aspects of where it's no longer narrow, but more broader applications, right? Like uh, uh, DeepMind again with the Gato, or you've seen this idea of Lambda coming again out of, out of Google and, and this uh, large language model. And, and it's so interactive that, you know, it's some controversy you may have seen if you yep. look it up. Yep. Yep. And this week's discussion about whether or not it's sentient. Yep. Yeah. But what happens is, is that if you look at what NVIDIA is saying in some of their keynotes and so on, um, yeah, uh, I, they're saying that the language models we use now, which are 175 uh, billion parameters of uh, parameters, like a measure of its capability, 
you know, there's one out of China that's over 1.7 trillion. There's another one out of Google that's 1.6 trillion. Um, and well, what about GPTX? You know, uh, uh, OpenAI with its GPT models. And and I noticed in the chat somebody was talking about DALI two, where you can just talk to the system or uh, type it in by you know by talking to text to uh, or speech to text. And whatever you you describe, it can create a photorealistic rendition of it, right? So, and this is just with the existing models. What 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 happens when the models hit over a hundred trillion, which is now some people are predicting even next year? I'm talking from 175 billion to over 100 trillion. Our brains have 85 billion neurons with synapses. Let's say over 100 trillion synapses. Well, what if? What, we're, we're going to have these large models that are able to encompass these kind of capabilities, uh, perhaps even next year. What does that mean? And, and then, and that's the challenge, right? All the positive aspects, but what, how could it be misused as well? Right. So. Right. And hence my organization and my interest in AI safety. We see it as the umbrella property that yeah. starts with things like making sure that our models and data sets can behave in ways that are fair, explainable, transparent, and well aligned with our basic notions of human dignity. We look at it at the 2027 time scale, just a few years out of what this means about widespread gross world product coming from non-human intelligence synthetic agents and what it means to have widespread human job displacement, but record high GWP into the 2035 and 2037 timescales of, we might have to have some serious conversations about what infrastructure we're putting in place before we're looking at things like intelligence takeoff situations. You um, know, all of these we see as one good continuum. Yeah, so so let's look at use cases or, or models that I think you should be watching. There's, there's one called the Please. Translucia Metaverse, and they're looking at good governance or responsible use of all of the aspects of their metaverse, which is, much broader than the than the one that Meta has come out with. It, it's about the digitization for the wellness, the goodness uh, of anything mm -hmm. that exists in society. You look at Patty Mays at uh, MIT and the work she's doing at the Media Labs, uh, the Fluid Interface uh, Interfaces Group. They've been working on these issues for over 30 years. Have a look at the work they're doing. Uh, as I mentioned, the CLA, the CEO Leadership Alliance, and the work uh, they're doing. Look at UNESCO. They came out with a recommendation on the ethical use of AI, but now they're trying to operationalize that in, in terms of managing this thing. Uh, IEEE and the Pay 7000 operational model of all the existing frameworks by saying, how can we as developers or people using tech can, can make sure it's safer? You have uh, Europe and their uh, regulations that they're putting forward. But you're also seeing this in the US, out of California and different parts of the US. So, yeah. so there's some positive signs and, and the key is to look for these use cases and then embed them in terms of your planning and the things you're doing. You have an upcoming speaker, uh, Sheldon uh, from uh, Darwin AI. I mean, they're a world That's leader cool. ranked in the top and I recommend the audience, you've got to stay for that because they're, they're working on this uh, explainable, responsible AI and embedding it so that anybody can use it in a way that's safe and particularly in manufacturing right now. So. And all these considerations matter. And the way we think about this internal to our software with our development operations team, a lot of people think that uh, the adage of move fast and break things is how they get to market quickly and how they stay ahead. But the reality is that is doing it the hard way. And the same applies for responsible AI methodologies. What you're looking for is to move faster and break fewer things. At the end of the day, it's less about uh, doing the right thing as much as doing data science and data engineering right to begin with. And as far as business leaders are convinced, it looks like that's becoming more and more of a norm as we're seeing the responsible AI space begin to grow in the capital influx that it's receiving. So kudos to you and your responsible AI symposium here. I think it's a great initiative. Mm -hmm. And to the audience who are who are participating, thank you for joining yeah. and listening to thank all of the all. great conversations here. And I know our time is up, so that's my message. Stay in tune with, with these folks who are doing such great work. Likewise, Stephen. Hey, if our audience wants to follow you and your work, what's the best way that they can find you on the net? Um, probably through LinkedIn, but the problem is I'm at my maximum of 30,000 connections for 10 years, oh <laughs> but I post a lot. So you'd have to do it as a follow. And then I post every day on, on, on transformational good stuff. Right. So. Excellent. Okay. Steven, 
it was a joy to get to have you. Thank you. This is fun as always. I'll send you an email. I look forward to following up a little later in the season. I'm so grateful that you could join us for this very special day. Thank you. Happy to do it. Amazing, outstanding, having a great time. Enjoy the rest of the session and your get together later. <laughs> Thank you. We wish you could be there. We'll, we'll, we'll pour a beer out for you, man. For the future, right? <laughs> for the future. Thank you, Let's Stephen. Bye.